Let's go ahead and call this meeting to order. It's the Community and Economic Development Committee meeting. Today is Thursday, April 6, 2023. Uh, we'll start out with introductions. I'm the chair, Pete Peterson. Kevin Cross. Felix Rivera. Randy Soult. And on the phone? Robin Hearn. Great. In, anyone else on the phone? Okay, fantastic. Uh, this is Claire Roth. I'm here representing legislative services. Okay, thanks, Claire. Well, let's start. Do we have uh, something we need to add to the agenda, Mr. Vice Chair? If we have time, uh, I just received from Dean, I believe it was yesterday, the most update to 20-22-100. Uh, uh, that is uh, third-party independent uh, review structural plans. Um, there's been a host of amendments after it came back from the uh, Structural Engineers Association of Alaska. We made a bunch of alterations. So if we have time, I wanted to discuss some of those changes that's in that S version. Uh, so we have adequate. It's it's slated to be uh, before the assembly on the 11th. And so if we have to extend, we will. Um, but I'm trying to get everybody to look at this S version as quickly as possible so we don't have to extend again. So thank you. All right, so we can add that on under a C under new business if we have time. How's that? Sound? Yeah, and what we'll do is I'd like to go through the agenda and then if we've covered everything in our adequate time, then we'll have it. I might extend it just so we can get it onto a regular, I might extend on the 11th just so we can make sure it gets before the CDC again with, with appropriate time, back here back from SEAC, uh, the Structural Engineers Association, as well as the building board. So you're saying possibly postpone it until the meeting of the 25th? Yes, if if necessary, I'm trying to get everybody to get their eyes on it uh, in a short amount of time, which sometimes requires some gymnastics. So. Okay. <clears throat> All right, well, let's start with some, is we have any, any more additional discussion about the uh, biennial uh, municipal marijuana licenses? Sorry, I'm sorry. For the marijuana licenses. Um, so there is a draft AO in front of you, and I think Dean is going to go through it. Um, but this has been submitted to the uh, agenda for the special meeting for introduction. Oh, okay. So this will be uh, for you at your next special meeting. Um, but I'll let Dean take over and kind of go through. Um, or. Um, All right, well, fantastic. Uh, go ahead, begin, Mr. Gates. <laughs> okay. By the way. Now. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Schiller. Um so yeah, this was I guess initially drafted with Miss Honest, who's our marijuana licensing expert and uh, legal arms, and I did some review. So I'll just try to walk through the changes. Um you know, a lot of it is just uh, very cosmetic. It's just taking out one and we so that this can become a biennial license, so once every two years. Um, I mean, kind of it speaks for itself when the title, and that's just all the changes about, I guess. Um, some of the uh, code text is in here for context. Um, let me know if I need to speak up, okay. <laughs> and so, um, 10 uh, first section is just a, it's, I guess most substantive section about the um, license uh, in renewal process. And um, most changes are on page three. And it, it's, uh, this phrase around in several places it just says, in the year the establishment requires renewal. And uh, that just helps so that uh, we have some licenses requiring renewal in even years and some in odd years. And so this is sort of generic. So when you issue a license, you're going to know which year you need renewal. If you issue a license, I guess, when we first started issuing licenses in 2016, uh, 2016, first license. Uh, an even year uh, after this passes, you're going to have to renew in that even year or every even year. If you issued a license in 2017, you're going to have to uh, renew your license every odd year. So that's how this transition works, and that's why this language works. And um, I think that uh, we may need, I guess, 
Uh, when we submitted this, I realized at the last moment we probably need a bit of language here that just sort of uh, explains that transition for the even and the odd number of years. It's in the AEM and it's in the attachment we have. It's exhibit A and it's described, but I think we might need something else in code here. And so uh, we see the same language here, uh, page four, uh, line nine here, that the establishment requires more. And uh, at the bottom of page four, subsection C, um, adding with this new subsection. And this is about the protest process. And so we have a dual licensing, uh, concurrent, I guess, jurisdiction with the state and its license and our marijuana licenses. And uh, with alcohol, we don't issue an alcohol license, actually. We have special language permits for alcohol. Okay, so this is a little bit different where it's a marijuana license and a state marijuana license. But the state is still doing annual. And I guess there's some legislative advocacy efforts to have the state go to uh, biennial licensing also. But who knows when that will happen and when that will get through. So we can do ours now. But we're still going to have every year of the opportunity to protest the state uh, license. So even if it's uh, a municipal marijuana licensee doesn't need to renew this year, we will have the state sending us the notice of the um, Alaska license and the opportunity to protest the Alaska license. So, so that's what this um, subsection C is about, bottom of page four. And um, then take out word and a couple of places, and that's about it. But I guess I would uh, just note the A M and exhibit A. Exhibit A, um, it's printed out in black and white, but uh, this sorted them by license bureau. And so, um, I guess, I mean, they're stronger glasses, but in the top uh, right, it's the number of even licenses, and they're all highlighted in yellow with the top part of this page, Exhibit A. And uh, it's shaded here, but there's 59 even and 52 off, so it comes out kind of evenly with a uh, uh, this year, uh, I actually spoke with the head of AMCO and told her that we were going to be working on this. She was very enthusiastic about that idea because it's it's not just here in Anchorage that we're short of inspectors. It's this, it's just that way all over the state. And so, um, Mr. Rivera. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, I remember in one of our conversations that the even and odd um, distinction for when the licenses will come up, um, there was a request from one of the departments, I forget which, to put that in the, in the code. Um, I see that you don't do this in this ordinance, which is fine by me. Um, I guess one, is it sufficient to just have it as an attachment here and just to delineate odds and evens and then two um how will you add new licenses onto the list and make that determination is that just something the clerk's office will do 
through the chair, um, Andy, with the newspaper's office. Uh, we, so this list is just kind of an example. It was done as like, what who is currently licensed to give us an idea of where we would stand if we went to this even odd and see how it would play out. Um, and right now, it's fairly even. So it would just continue on that way. If a license was issued in an even year, we would put them on the even year cycle, a car renewal cycle, and odd. And so the list doesn't necessarily need to keep compiling as we move on. This was just kind of our initial research to see how we look if we went this route. So the clerk's office would keep track of that. And um, this is kind of to notify applicants early on who have it that will be the initial ones starting this process and having to shift. So we'll be doing notifications to licensees should this go forward. Um, and we usually do information through the marijuana industry, um, through their organizations, and we send it to all the licensees. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I may add something to that, and um, I think Mr. Rivera, uh, when you asked, is it sufficient? And that's what I noted, but when it was uh, uh, submitted to the about the ordinance language and the amendments to code, it doesn't actually say we're going to go to an even odd sort of uh, system for determining when licenses would be removed. And so I think that we do need a little language either by floor amendment or an S version. But also, uh, that's sort of the policy question. Is that how it should be determined uh, when a licensee should renew every two years by the even odd year when it's initially issued? And I suspect that's a good conversation to have because some licensees uh, um, have multiple licenses. So they have a vertically integrated business. And I don't know if they got their cultivator and manufacturer and retail license at the same time or different years. So if they got them in different years, maybe they want to have renewal be the same time for their three integrated business licenses. Uh, I don't know if that's the right way to describe them, but uh, so there might be some situations where that makes more sense. But you know, that's the policy question. And I guess from an administrative um, perspective, this makes a lot of sense because it comes out about even 59, 52 when the year issue and it's uh, very reasonable and understandable. That uh, I guess, you know, for whoever's doing this 20 years from now, it's easy to transition to a um, business license expert. Because man, it's going to retire someday, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, I'm, many of the marijuana businesses may have started out as with just retail or, or cultivation, but realized that to, to be more successful going forward, they were going to have to become vertically integrated and, and cover all their bases. And uh, so that's why they may have had a, a license for for one thing in one year and another one in another year. Mandy? Uh, through the chair, the license issue dates, I think, won't be a problem, even if establishments have multiple licenses that are issued in different years. Um, by code, we're required to send notice to the applicant that their renewal is due. So they would get notice for the year in which their specific license was required to renew. So we would specify the license type and number, and they would know that's the one this year is renewing. So we do send that notice, and that's part of our normal process anyways. It would just be separating out the years. Mr. Rivera. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess the policy question to me is, is it more efficient to bundle all of those licenses into one year, both for the clerk's office as well as the applicant? Um, I can imagine that the applicant may prefer to just have deal with all of their renewals <coughs> in one year versus having to deal with renewals every year for different types. Sorry, Quincy, I'm scared. Um, I feel like if we leave it unspoken in the ordinance, it gives us the flexibility to do that. There can be okay. exceptions. But right now, the split was just we don't want everybody getting on the same two year renewal path in the same year. Okay. And if I may, I, I guess that was um, sort of the, the crux of the discussion. This was maybe a couple months ago when we were discussing this in committee. Um, of whether the split needed to be in code or not. And so the guidance that I heard at the time was, yes, we should put that split in code, but I'm sounding like 
the other saying, no, we don't need to just give us guidance, give us intent, and, and we can deal with it outside of code. Is that accurate? That's my point. I okay. Think so too, I think from the licensing standpoint, I agree that it's easier to make an internal process um, than codify because then we're, it's very rigid and we don't have that flexibility. Mr. Gates, uh, and even with the uh, uh, internal process, I think there should be at least a phrase here saying the municipal clerk should determine you know, which year's licenses uh, are renewed. Something as simple as that. Then delegate that authority to determine how the system works to the clerk. Yeah. Well, as, as long as there's communication between the, the muni and the state so that somebody doesn't fall through the cracks, uh, so to speak, you know, or or the, the state thinks they're renewing this year when we think they're renewing next year, that, you know, but that, that'll all probably uh, get straightened out within the first year, hopefully. And uh, that, that will be sort of a standard operating procedure situation, hopefully. Any, <clears throat> any other questions, comments, discussions on this particular item? Yes. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, Brian Yale with the Anchorage Planning Department. So just in case anybody's wondering, a special anchor permit and a license are linked for code between Title 21 and Title 10, but this won't have any effect whatsoever on Title 21. So there's no corresponding amendment to Title 21 that's necessary to so, okay. No amendments necessary to Title 21. Okay, fantastic. It's good, good to know. Okay, well, uh, I think we might be finished with this item. Anything else, Mr. Gates? Um, well, I would just add that while I think this will save, I guess, some resources for this having the clerk's office and inspections there with the firm, that um, we haven't actually quantified and whether some of the economic effects is required. So we're going to look at that next and add one if it's needed. I'm not sure if it will save us more than 30,000 annually, for example, and we'll have a C added here. And um, I would also say that it sort of uh, dovetails with, I guess, what might be some increasing workload for uh, the licenses, uh, municipal licenses program, uh, based on some other items coming up. <laughs> I see. Okay. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, let's go down the agenda to the next item. We'll have a discussion on short-term rentals. Uh, awesome. Yeah, Mr. Soul. <coughs> okay, so we're going to walk through a presentation. Let <coughs> me send you a different one. That is not the one. Give me a second. Turn the lights down. We need a popcorn. Yeah. Hey, Chris. So I'll go ahead and get started. So <clears throat> what I want to do is walk through, we have an AO built that's with me and has a lot of subparts to it. Um, but what we thought we want to do is get feedback from everybody because there's there's a lot of rabbit holes you can go down. And and going through this process was, was pretty helpful because it actually led me to a different conclusion. And, and I'll say that conclusion is do nothing is always an option. Um, while she pulls that up, I can get started on some things. So the first thing, um, short-term rental data. The second slide. Um, so we have about 7,000 STRs in Alaska. And this is, this is data coming from the Alaska Economic Trends uh, September 2022 issue, which is also from Air DNA and U.S. Census data from 2016 to 2020. This is an alley presentation, so yeah, there we go. She does it like that. <laughs> oh, sorry, I have I have two thingies here, so yeah, there. One more time. Okay. 
hit it one more time. And you can see Anchorage, we have <coughs> roughly, based on Q2 of 2022, 2,323 short-term rentals. Um, that's just shy of 2% of our housing market, okay? So go ahead and go to the next slide. Oh, you want questions? Are those licensed ones or are those ones that they just track? I mean, how, how do we know? This is, there's this a lot is, of people that operate under this. Yeah, account. this is just coming from the Airbnbs, right. the VRBO websites, right? So, so, so are, we, are we collecting uh, taxes on... Oh, bed tax. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, thanks. Yeah. So the, the problem, and I'll preface, is there a problem? So short-term rentals. So we have investors purchasing multiple homes and converting them into STR investments. I had a friend just the other week said he's going to come to Anchorage, buy 10 houses and make them STRs. Okay. Is it a problem or not? So for me, it pulls housing inventory off the market. But again, it's only roughly 2% right now. Does it also keep house prices higher because there's, an, there's sort of an artificial demand? It's not home buyers, it's investors that are buying these houses. And so in my mind, it is because it's, it's playing with that inventory that's for sale. It, yes. So you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So you said STRs are, are at only 2%. Is that municipal wide? That is municipal wide. Did you look at like Girdwood, Chigaki River, split it out like that? That's, that's where this data comes from. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And there's more in that September 2022 issue of the Alaska Economics Trends Report. Okay. Um, another issue is dark homes. You know, people that are wealthy enough that can buy a home in Girdwood and let it sit dark all year for the two weeks they're there. And the last, um, is it a problem? Accessory dwelling units. You know, we, we put forward accessory dwelling units, especially in Girdwood, to provide more housing, and a lot of them are being converted to STRs. Problem or not, they're still building housing that may not be STRs forever. Okay, next slide. So again, STR is creating what I think is maybe an artificial demand on the sale market. Next slide. So the goals of the ordinance, let's protect public health and safety, uh, create code that protects the occupant of the STR. And a lot of this is from researching several of the municipalities. Um, it kind of started as a Gerbwood project, so we started looking at uh, mainly the resort areas, but then also branched out into other municipalities to see what they're doing, and there's a good reason behind everything that was that maybe maybe proposed and why they did it. Uh, safeguard the property and neighborhood value. Um, there's examples of of condo units, multiple family units that have been almost completely converted to SDR rentals. So now you're the lone full-time resident there, and you have a constant transient um, uh, clientele going in and out of the of the building. Is that good or bad? Don't know about, is that adversely affecting the neighborhood? That's a matter of opinion. Uh, protect property rights. So again, it's your property. I don't want to impose on your right on what you can do with that property as long as you're within the municipal code. And I'm kind of a free market person, so eventually the market should sort itself out. Um, I don't think that's true for a resort community. I think you could probably go down there and buy a million dollar home and you could STR and make money. Uh, and lastly, collect accurate data. Next slide. And then the final piece is a gentle nudge. So how do we push STRs back to putting houses back on the market? And I don't want to dictate. Um, I think one of the examples of later is in Hawaii, they tried to force STRs back onto the market. And a lot of the, the residents, the locals, STR was the only way they're keeping their home. So what happened is they ended up selling these homes that were then purchased and turned into dark homes. So it, it had the adverse intent. Um, so a gentle nudge, I'll get to that later. Next slide. Uh, key components, so implement a permit, include a modest permit fee, that would probably be our nudge, um, enforce public safety requirements, grandfather, so I want to grandfather everything. So if you're currently doing it, don't freak out. We want to grandfather you. If you're in construction phase, we would have grandfathered you to a point when you get your permit and when you get your certificate of occupancy. And then the questionable piece is, do we want to establish caps and limitations more forcefully pushing STRs to permanent long-term housing? Next slide. 
uh, grandfather clause, so existing STRs, you can do what you're doing still um, until you sell it or no longer wish to STR the property. That could be multiple units, um, that could be locations, that could be proximities. And then those that are, have made an investment decision, have decided to build an STR or an ADU, knowing they're going to STR, and that's how they're going to pay for it, we don't want to interfere with that either. So no adverse effects to any current citizens. Next slide. Uh, safety requirements. So trying to make it not onerous, uh, owner safety inspection. Um, the owner would make a, a statement saying they meet the qualifications, meet code. Um, we're not going to go inspect all the homes, but we could. Uh, your insurance requirements, requirements are met because there is a transition when you go from a single family home to now a business and you're renting to the public. Um, you meet the STR permit review criteria. We have a right of inspection, warrant inspections. Uh, you have a responsible manager, which I'll talk about, and of course you adhere to municipal code. Next slide. Uh, responsible manager, so time restrictions, and this is pretty common amongst other municipalities. No more than an hour away. And what this is trying to prevent is that absent investor, the person that lives out of state and a problem develops, they have no resource locally they can call on, they're calling an APD, um, you know, a heater goes out, window gets broken. Where's your, where's your response to that for the client? Uh, someone's having a party. Where's your response for the neighbor? So again, no more than an hour away that can handle that response. It uh, can be handled by phone. If it's something that can be handled by phone, call a handyman, great. You don't actually have to go to the property, but it's just trying to negate the absent, the absent owner or absent management of the property. Next slide. Uh, permitting, so 12 month rolling term. Uh, renewals wouldn't be unreasonably unheld, withheld. Uh, standard online application. Colorado Springs has a great system that is almost fully automated online. Minimal involvement from the city as far as cost to run the program. Uh, self inspection certification on there, downloaded, uploaded. Uh, tax permit ID, insurance would be uploaded. And a lot of your uh, Airbnbs and your VRBOs take care of this for you, and there's companies that can do this for you as well. And then the owner statement that you meet the SDR permit review criteria. Uh, again, nominal fee. So in, in all numbers and that I throw out are just placeholders. They're not the actual number. They're, I think they're close, but it's always up for debate. So um, nominal fee, $400 for a permit. Uh, you would waive that for long-term rental. What's long-term rental mean? Uh, using the PDF, PBPFD requirement, greater than 180 days. I'm flexible. It could be greater than five months. Whatever we think is the right to get, again, get long-term housing back on the market. Uh, owner occupancy. Are you there for, again, a period of time, 181 days? Uh, military deployment. So again, waived if you get orders to get posted to another assignment, another locale. That way you can STR your property so you can maintain it, pay for it, um, and not just have to sit there and pay a mortgage. So, yes, sir. so do you uh, think, <coughs> so are these gonna be renewed on this same day every year that, that they got their occupancy permit or? They got the permit. Or, or it's, it's like, there's not January 1st or? No, no. no. Yeah, because you don't want to, I mean, January 1st is an idea, but then you create a, a large rush. Right. And by metering it over the year, you'll have waves, but it's it's more manageable. So again, looking at the implementation of this, um, I think Color Springs runs with one person. Really? So a lot of it is automated, right? And it's very simple, non-intrusive, but has the ability to provide some enforcement if you're not meeting the criteria. Fantastic. Uh, next slide. Uh, to transfer or not to transfer with the sale of a home. Uh, and I'm mixed on this. Right now, a lot of places have that it would not transfer with the sale of a home. So next slide, I think talks a little more about it. It's so pros. Um, if, it transfer, if it doesn't transfer, it put, puts houses back on the market. And if you're up against a cap, that person would then go on a wait list. So if we cap it at 2 3% of the market, um, that SGR would effectively be pushed back. But again, if you're buying it, you're buying it knowing that it's not gonna have an SGR permit. The con, um, again, an SGR permit might impart some value. 
So who are we to take that value away from the homeowner when they want to sell it? Um, I'm mixed on this, uh, on, where it would, on where it would go. Uh, next slide. And I will mention I'm, I'm working with this with Meg Zalatel and Suzanne LaFrance. So other controversial items. Uh, again, you cap STRs to a percentage of the housing market. Um, so you have a cap. Everyone currently goes grandfathered. Again, we're less than 2% in Anchorage, according to the data. Um, if you if you're apply after or above the cap, you go on a wait list. It would uh, adjust up and down with new housing starts, and exemptions would not be counted. Uh, limit ownerships to less than three units, and this is to prevent the corporate investor. The, the companies, which you see in other locations, companies are coming in, buying houses, and turning them into short-term rentals as investments. It's not really what I think we want. I think we're okay with, with people as an entity owning a few for investment that helps them re retain maybe that house that might have been their, their house they grew up in that they were gifted or willed when their parents passed away. Uh, zoning or overlays. Again, do you want to limit where STRs can be and have different restrictions for Girdwood versus Anchorage versus somewhere else? Or do you not want to have any kind of overlays at all and complicated. You want to allow STRs anywhere. Um, you know, think about it, if you start getting to four over ones or five over ones, you might have some mixed classification on zoning. Do you allow them there? Something to think about. Uh, no more than three on a property. Uh, so that gets to, again, a condo or let's say a, a, a housing subdivision. Do you want it to get saturated with STRs? And you see examples of that in lower 48. Again, condo towers that have been converted to STR. Probably the closest thing we, I think, have to that is probably the inlet tower. I think it has a high number of STRs in it or transient. There's several. There's one of the okay. seven. There's a couple. There's a couple yeah. of complex out there that are primarily STRs. And is that good or bad? So that's why these are more controversial. Uh, distance requirements, you know, X number of feet between STRs. So again, you don't get a concentration or saturation trying to maintain the value of the neighborhood. And I think a lot of this is butte if you have good tenants and good landlords that maintain um, the neighborhood and the peace and quiet enjoyment of your property. Uh, next slide. Other ideas um, that we didn't talk, that we haven't put in, we just talked about, could you earmark STR property taxes towards housing development? Earmark STR bed tax towards housing development? Uh, earmark any excess permit fees, so fees in excess of what it takes to run the program towards housing, which that one some other places have done. Uh, do you put further limitations on ADUs? Next slide. So next steps. So after all of this, it kind of brings me back to, um, I'm not sure this is the right tool. I'm not sure we want to do anything in this space. Um, what are the benefits of doing it? Why would we do it? I certainly don't want it to be just so we can collect a $400 permit fee to run a program that we may not need. Um, if we did go forward, strongly recommending just a registration process, just a permitting process, again, to meet those initial goals, collect data, understand the market, ensure the safety of the guest, the, the quiet enjoyment of the neighborhood, things we would expect, and address some of the complaints we hear about STRs. And that's it. Questions? Thank you for that feedback, presentation. Uh, any questions from uh, members, uh, assembly members, or members from the building department? Comments. Oh, I shot. No one died over here. Ryan? <laughs> Go ahead. No one died. <laughs> uh, Ryan, you with the planning permit. Uh, just to, the situation in Hawaii when the short term rentals were taken off the market and put on the actual back in the real estate market, what was the effect of the home values because of that? Was there any data you can call? No, we don't have home values. What they're trying to do, they're trying to do more of a push to get SDR get houses back in the market. And so they, they made it harder to maintain an SDR. So people stepped away from the SDR. But that income helped them keep the home. Ended up having to sell the home now. And at that point, I, it's like you see all over the place. I was probably in the family for 30 years. 
bought it for sixty grand, sold it for two million, you know, to a dark home. I'm sorry, I'm not from the building department, but I'm from the legal department. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering when you're the two percent of housing, do you do any differentiation between Gerwood and everybody else? No. Because I can see, I feel like Gerwood has a bigger problem than we do if you think about it. So maybe there would be some value to applying caps and all, the, all of the stuff. Yeah, and that's where the zoning kind of comes in, or the overlays. It just started as kind of a Gerwood project, and I was like, well, if I go to Gerwood, we should do it through municipality. But then it's two, it really is two different problems. Yeah. So, I mean, and you talk to uh, the Breckenridge's and the Vales, and it's almost out of control because the market has gotten so hot that again, I can, you can almost buy anything in STR, and and there is no market correction that's ever going to occur. Mr. Cross, just to show hands so I get an idea, did anybody here own rentals? Okay, a couple of us. Anybody own short term rentals? A couple of us. All right, excellent. So my personal experience is, you know, I own a little over 120 rental units, and I at one point had over 10 Airbnbs down the for short term rentals. And the market's completely changed. So the first thing is what that, to me is always what drives short term rentals, and a lot of short term rental properties. That's what I didn't see are no longer being used like vacation rentals. Okay, now quite a few of them are, but those are filling the gaps. Almost all my short-term rentals, uh, if you put them on a furnish finder, are being occupied by doctors, nurses, professionals, because we have an employment shortage up here. The short-term rentals provide a very valuable service. They provide furnished, nice housing units for people that are here for a week, two weeks, three weeks, that are professionals that need a place to stay. Because our employers and our anybody's dying for employees, so they're shipping people out, okay? So I have a downtown condo, for instance, where I have a doctor that stays six weeks on, and then he's like four weeks off. He comes back six weeks on, four weeks off, six weeks on. He's got a two-year contract. That four weeks in between, I'll stick short-term people in. But otherwise, he gets it for that six weeks, and he pays almost $4,000 a month for one bedroom, two bath. Okay, fully furnished right downtown. So I think part of what we got to look at is also we need – we need worker housing, right? And some of that is transitional. People coming in and coming out, and what does that look like? And, and and if we penalize that and make it more difficult or we run that up or we eliminate and eliminate that, that's just gonna push higher on employment wages because how are we gonna where are we gonna house them? The other thing that we're dealing with, and you guys are probably aware of this, is why we why short term rentals right now are such a high hot item. And that is because our large hotel chains are operating at a fraction of their capacity. Because Hilton and because Marriott and because the extended stay and stuff, I know because we do their laundry for them, one of my businesses, they're only operating at 70% of their rooms because they don't have the house cleaning staff. They can't find people to do sheets. That's why they're farming out their laundry right now because they can't find enough people to do the bed. So what do they do? They drop by 20 or 30% capacity and then they raise their rents 20 or 30% and they're making just as much money as they do at a full, but it's at a diminished capacity. So all those people who still want to come into town, where are they going? Well, they flood into the housing market, and that's why it becomes much more a higher incentive for individuals to then use Airbnbs. The other thing that's happened is, let's be honest, is that our tenant quality has gone down and that people are harder on properties. So from a landlord standpoint, the out-of-town guests are actually much nicer on properties than tenants that I find locally. And so then... But I have restrictions on what I can collect. I can, if it's under $2,000 a month, I can only collect one, one month's worth of rent as a security deposit. That doesn't go as far as it used to anymore with inflation. So there's a lot of different things, and there's different mechanisms and levers I see that we can pull. But ultimately, what it comes down to is we need to make it much more affordable to build housing and get units up because that drives the cost down. Because so much of the short-term rentals, like down in Girdwood, it makes zero economic sense to build something to do long-term rentals out, unless you're willing to subsidize or just lose money. They have to be short-term rentals. You have to make money on it. That's resort town. So I think in those cases, I think the way you resolve it is you tax them in resort locations and you use that money to subsidize affordable housing, because otherwise it just doesn't pencil. And the way that we solve short-term rental housing here is 
is again short term rental isn't creating a housing shortage. We have a housing shortage that then just gets that short term rentals kind of take advantage of this opportunity. It's really just how do we affordably create more, you know, more units? How do we get more units built? Because supply and demand will happen. Once we get more units built, what happens? And we have more people we have to employ because we're losing that 25 to 35 demographic. They're like I can't find anywhere to stay, so they leave the state. That's that's all those service jobs that you need in order to support the industry. Once the hotels open back up and they can run to 100% capacity, what is that going to be? With downward pressure on short-term rentals, plus downward pressure on rents because you have more units, and then you have less short-term rentals. So then it feeds itself. So it's not a short-term rental problem. It's a shortage of units problem. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's my so, that's my soapbox. And and this will be presented to the body in the work session tomorrow. But that's that's kind of the question going through this is again should, doing nothing is an option. Should yeah. we do nothing? If we do something, I'm kind of in favor of this definitely fully scaled back version of safety, security, collect data. You know, not going to impose a lot of restrictions. You know, maybe the, the fees enough to run the program, but that's that's what we want to get feedback on. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, I guess the first question I have is: so we're going to have a work session tomorrow. Is there going to be an ordinance for us to look at tomorrow, or is it just going to be the same? Yeah, just, <coughs> Dean has the ordinance. Um, it has a lot of the controversial items in it. We can just pull them out. And, and so we wanted to get Dean involved early to make sure we didn't get too far ahead of ourselves with legal. Sure. And now the next piece is we don't want to get too far ahead, ahead of ourselves without hearing what the body thinks. And again, it's, yeah. it's like a menu. And we may say, yeah, I think we're all in agreement. Strike all this stuff. We can put it in the closet, and maybe later we pull out different pieces. Again, there's, there's, we're, behind, we're late to the game. There's plenty of communities that are well ahead of us. And we can even see the ones that have enacted some of this and then gone back later and repealed it. And you can see why they repealed it, what failed. So, okay. So, um, um, have, have, have we been communicating with the Girdwood Board of Supervisors or anyone down there during the development of this? Yes, they've been getting feedback, but they haven't seen the resolution. No one's seen that, um, okay. except for the small group. Uh, but getting feedback from real estate agents, GBOS. Um, so the next step would then be to share this presentation as well. All right, so. Mr. Rivera. Yeah, um, so I guess since we're having the work session t tomorrow, I'll consider further remarks. But for now, I will say what was presented today feels way more complicated than what I thought would be done. It, it definitely feels like um, a huge amount of regulation. Uh, so I'll have to chew on it. Is that is that a presentation up on the website? I just put it okay. okay, great. Then yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. look it over, chew on it, and prepare more for tomorrow. But and, and I would agree with you. And I think that's where kind of going through the process helps you realize like, do we really want to do all this? And I'm not sure. I'm not there. Well, and Mr. That's, that's why we were bringing bring this brought this up in the first place as we were trying to find out it, where is it where we are and where we're going to try to be you know and so it's uh, it's, it's not something that is easy to make changes to and so yeah it's, it's a good idea to look to see what has been successful in other jurisdictions and what hasn't so that we can maybe avoid some of those rabbit holes when when we do it you know so <coughs> Ms. Dern, Mr. Dern, Mr. Ms. Dern on the phone. Go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to ask if anyone had consulted with um, some of, uh, maybe with Girdwood, with with Seward, with Homer, some of the areas around um, to see what type of unintended consequences came um, when they first started to introduce these short-term rentals. I know in Seward right now, um, they've, they've really had to rethink um, how that serves their area um, as a result of outside buyers coming in. And so uh, it's something we could discuss at the work session tomorrow. So I, I mean, we don't have to go into full depth here. And I know that a lot of work's been done to, to do the research, but I'm just wondering if in Alaska, you know, we've really studied 
what's happened in other places and, and, and what they're needing to claw back now in order to be able to maintain um, the level of ha housing adequate for year-round residents. Thank you. Yeah, Seward was not one of the places we looked at, so I'd be interested in hearing more about the problems they're facing and, and see if they're common problems that other communities have faced as well. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about uh, Seward or Homer, but yeah, that yeah they definitely get a huge influx of tourists uh, down there. You probably used to be more when you could actually keep the fish instead of having to catch and release. But uh, and we've kept this pretty tight because once once we open it up like this, we're going to start losing control of it. Um, but at some point, we have to do that to get the feed to get the broader based feedback in. So. Right. Right. Fantastic. Any, anything else, Mr. Cross? Yeah, just one other thought. Um, you know, it's interesting because I have, uh, there's been certain properties I've owned that ideally only worked really well as short term rentals. And primarily, even though we eliminated parking minimums, it had to do with midtown apartments, small apartment buildings I had that were four to eight units that had four to eight parking spaces, even though they were two and three bedroom units. And so what I had to do, because if I long-term rental, you know, if you got a three-bedroom unit, they, they got two cars. And then you got snow removal and just packed up. So the easiest way to resolve that, to make sure that the, and of course it was very profitable, was on like a fourplex, do two long-term units and the other short-term rentals, because short-term rentals typically Uber, or they have one rental. And I was able to resolve a parking issue and a congestion issue, and everybody in the neighborhood was much happier than having a rental unit that they end up with three vehicles, maybe two that run and one that doesn't. And so, I mean, in certain buildings you looked at it, so as far as the capacity or percentage of the property and whether you limit that, I guess it kind of depends on the property. Some properties, you know, they just function better for short-term rentals because they don't have the parking capacity, particularly with their larger bedrooms. Yeah. Uh, perfect example is that it's a neighborhood right across the street from Lowe's, that's 45th and 46th. They built most of those fourplexes in the late 60s, early 70s, and they are 12 bedroom fourplexes with four and five parking spots in a cul-de-sac, and there's like six of them. And so you're talking 20 plus vehicles, uh, or excuse me, there's 30 plus vehicles in an area in a cul-de-sac where they already have limited snow storage. There's no cur there's no sidewalk parking because they're all backed up driveway to driveway, and they all only have four parking spaces a piece. So, yeah, so I, that whole neighborhood ends up becoming short-term rentals because it's close to the airport, close to Midtown, and the parking challenges are resolved. So I would encourage everyone to think for tomorrow, yeah. is there a problem? And what is, do STR, are STRs causing it? So even, even you get the Girdwood, if I were to push STRs back to housing, but I just end up with dark homes. Yeah. Well, and so, you know, were you, were you talking about site condos, is what, what they used to call them? Oh, what are you going uh, No, no, no. Because I, you know, when I was looking for uh, to move to East Anchorage from South Anchorage years, gosh, that's 16 years ago already, uh, one of the couple of the places I looked at were site condos, and I kept going, I said, well, where does everybody park you know and, uh, and that was the reason that there was a big uh, there was change there were changes made so they stopped building those and uh, but though I would think that maybe a site condo might be attractive for a, as a short-term rental because of the shortage of parking that you uh, mentioned earlier Chris yeah thank you I was just curious uh, you did a lot of comparisons to other jurisdictions. Was any sort of crosswalk developed that said um, the issue of you know limiting the number of STRs a permit holder can own? Vail does it. Denver doesn't. Did you do any sort of analysis like that? Uh, thank you. That that would, that would be interesting um, to look at. And then secondly, uh, there there was a portion of the presentation that deal that dealt with um, its safety inspections. And, and ensuring that the STRs meet the minimum standards of safety, which we all want. Um, I would just put in a plug for considering that notion um, rental market-wide instead of focusing just on STRs. And the reason being that, in my experience at the city, we dealt with a lot of um, 
non-compliant properties that were literally life safety death traps and they were being rented out. Sometimes it was a three bedroom house that the owner was renting to three different people. Um, in, in Spinar, we're working on a project where we bought an old uh, single family home that actually had been uh, segregated into a nineplex somehow. Mathematically impossible, I thought, but no. Nope. <laughs> uh, and these are all structures that do not meet basic life safety requirements. And there's probably a lot of those on the market. So um, jurisdictions like Washington and others have just a basic, if you're renting anything, single family home on, you have to meet a certain safety threshold every five, 10 years, whatever the measure is. But I, I just put it in a plug for considering something like that. Yeah, and, and we had public safety meeting yesterday. I can't remember how many fires were at Anchorage, but a common theme seemed to be smoke detector not working. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, well, <clears throat> it's unfortunate we had a, a large number of fires this winter, m more than normal. Uh, and uh, it, it's uh, maybe just the luck of the draw, but uh, unattended cooking is, is and, and smoking, those are the two main causes of, of the fires. And there, I think the unattended cooking is worse in the winter because in the summer, the unattended cooking is probably on the grill outside somewhere, <laughs> and so if so if you burn dinner there, you may not get get the problem indoors when the fire gets started. Anyway, any other comments, questions on short-term rentals? And we, and we do have a work session on this. What time is that work session tomorrow? Hold on. Second. Twelve forty. Twelve forty. Yeah, for an hour. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so if, if anyone's on the phone and wants to call in or come to that, that'll it's a work session tomorrow at room one fifty five at City Hall at twelve forty PM. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Salt. Appreciate that. I guess we'll be heading down to new business at this point. And we have non traditional housing and utilities. Do you have uh, something you want to discuss about that, Mr. Cross? Yeah, so I just want to bring this up to our building department, planning department. This is, this is something that keeps coming up in assembly work sessions on housing, okay? So you guys are probably aware that right now in Anchorage, uh, we have almost 6,000 mobile homes that are still in operation. A large percentage of them were built in the 60s and 70s and are falling apart. Uh, there's a couple large uh, trailer mobile part, uh, mobile home subdivisions in uh, Chiakiga River we know of, one particularly Forest Park, where out of the 48 units, I think only two of them can be moved. The rest have been deemed just uh, structurally just complete failures. And so, but that park has some environmental issues. The, the water lines and sewer lines were not installed correctly. So all the trailers have to move in order to do the environmental fix because the sewer lines are over the water lines and they're all leaking. And so what do we do? Well, you know, now we've got 120 people living in here who are now suddenly displaced. And that's just one trailer park. There's others that also have issues that just haven't surfaced yet, for lack of a better analogy, okay? Mostly, as you're familiar with, DEC issues with buried heating fuel oil lines that were done in the 60s before 1964 and the 90, early 70s, or water and sewer treatments. It just at, at the time, it was not very well regulated. It was just done by the owners. So we've got a lot of larger trailer parks out there that are going to start rearing their heads. But as much as we can dislike the way they've done, the fact is that trailers, mobile units, tiny homes and stuff are a growing trend. And they don't use the, it's not the same construction as it used to be. Okay, so we're looking at if we haven't unintentionally created some burdens because as we've been speaking, we need more units. And when we displace 120 people, where do they go? Because we can't build apartment buildings fast enough. I mean, we're, we're literally buying our apartment buildings for, us, for assisted living for low income. What do we do with these people? There's no housing inventory out there. Every house that hits the market in Eagle River right now receives 10 to 12 offers. Like it's a, it's a bidding war, you know, right? And that's even on the, in, in, and that's on anything under 500,000. Do you think somebody who's currently maybe in a service job, who's currently living in a mobile home, who's depending, do you think they're looking to go buy a five or $600,000 home? No. So they, they can't qualify, right? And not only that, but in light of the higher interest rates, right, the debt to income ratios, the credit score requirements, it's getting more difficult, credit requirements to buy homes, okay? 
Why they don't want people to default when you have areas of in, when you have areas of inflation and they're curious and we know that the Fed has come out and said we're going to increase uh, unemployment we want to see it go up another one one and a half percent then lenders are increasing the credit score requirement reserve requirements employment history on buyers because they're concerned they don't want people to default on mortgage so now it's getting even harder to get mortgages which exacerbates the problem so we're looking at what can we do and is there a, is there an opportunity to take advantage of some of the new constructions and modular and non-typical tiny home design and allow for that. Now, it may be that we already allow that, but maybe it's our lot size. So I've been looking at everything. And I've been, and I'd love to hear and love to maybe have set up a work session or where we can dig into that to say, is there a way that we can get a little more compact housing using some of these affordable building methods um, you know, whether that's a combination of pre-approved plans on a modular house where they can come in and we just put in some uh, consideration of uh, construction design. Um, because I think the housing, with, with what I've been learning and researching about our mobile home situation and some of these parks that are on the verge of, uh, of, of collapse, our housing problem is just going to get worse. I mean, another good earthquake and you're going to have another couple hundred people living in these things. They're going to have to find a place to go. Randy. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of inventory that's running to the end of its life or need a major repair. But just want to throw in that um, I've talked about this with AEDC and, and Bill Pop is of pretty sound mind that the, the Gen Zers don't want a house. They no. don't want um, what they want is an apartment. So that 400, 800 square foot condo unit that they can shut the door and go out into the wilderness and have experiences is kind of what they're looking for. So I think we've got to change our traditional thinking that a house is, you know, a white picket fence in a yard and a, and a single family home. And now we're looking at maybe going up. Real, over once, <clears throat> ones. I'm glad you bring that up. Real estate quiz question. What are the most expensive houses based on a price per square foot that can be sold right now in Anchorage? Does anybody know where those are? I'm sure you're going to tell that me that sells for four hundred dollars a square foot. Over twenty of them at four hundred dollars a sell square foot have sold in less than a year. It's going to be condos. New Naka Valley, two bedroom, one bath, seven hundred and twenty square foot homes on five thousand square foot lots. Why? No HOA. Two, one plumbing wall, and for forty five hundred bucks, you can remodel that entire house. You can put a roof on it for five grand. It's just a four twelve pitch. Some of them, you know, I mean, it's just. What it's super easy. It's a square, but it has its own yard. So maybe what we look at, right, is we look at our lot size minimums because if you're only building a 720 square foot house, do you need a 7,000 square foot lot? Can't it be 3,000 square feet? Couldn't it be? I mean, you've got, if it's a two bedroom, one bath, they're not gonna have. And so maybe what we do is we look at that. And that's part of all this conversation I wanna have, which is when you look at, the highest, the fastest selling, highest per house square foot of real estate to sell is the affordable stuff that sells for 300000 And they're tiny little houses. But they have yards. They have privacy. They don't share walls. They're simple and easy to maintain. It's a boiler with one zone valve. Or it's a, you know what I mean? Like, so, or it's an on-demand. It's one bathroom. Those literally, it's a bidding war every time they hit the market. And they sell for over what they ask. Their average sale price around three hundred thousand dollars for a seven hundred and twenty square foot house, and if you look at them, they're not even fancy. The really fancy ones go for almost three fifty. It's ridiculous, but that's an example of what could be done or what the market is after. They're not after these big houses with eight garages and stuff like that. I mean, yes, there's a market for it, but that is your single young couple who either has one kid or no kids, or their kids are canines or cats. First time home buyer. First time home buyer. Perfect. First time home buyer. Mortgage payment under 2000 or under, and I own the house. So, how do we promote that kind of construction as well as because they're rectangles and they're not fancy? If we have pre approved plans and we have a minimum lot size and a builder can go in and they got the pre approved plans, it's not a complicated construction. 720 square foot square rectangle. And those would be wildly profitable. Builders would love those. But I don't think, one, the builders don't even understand, one, educating them that the market's there. And two, okay, if you go in and you buy an acre lot, what does that look like to put several of these up and create a nice little community and don't make it look like track housing? 
And I would like to see us promote or come up with a, a plan that allows for that to happen, utilizing some of the modular construction where they can build it off-site and have them kits and just put them together. We can expedite that permit process, the inspection process, you know, and uh, they can do their F and F permit, and then whether and how does that work? But that's what I want to have with the building department, because I, I think that's a, I think that's a huge benefit, a huge way that we can solve and get housing units up fast, and that there's a huge market for them. So you could prefab some of those walls and. Well, it's a 720 square foot little house. You could build it in a yeah. You could you know the great thing about it is your year round construction. You build it off site. You still got to have visual inspections, which is you know. Uh, and I'm not, and that's where I'm working with the building department on what that looks like. But you know, these little houses like the Naka Valley, there's literally one plumbing wall. The kitchen's on one side, the bath is on the other, and then there's a closet with a mechanical. It's 10 feet. Almost everything's in 10 feet. I think there's great examples of like manufactured homes that aren't your traditional double wide looking home. They, yeah. they can make them pretty darn unique nowadays. So I wanted to talk to, um, I think it's Matt Carey or Max Carey over at Carey Homes. He's, he's out of supply. He says he's been having trouble getting supplies on those. I want to talk about if he, if he knew any restrictions. But more from the building department, you know, I know Widener did some. I would love to hear their experience in dealing with some of the newer construction methods and what they've been working on and where they see opportunities, where they see some of the complications. If they're aware of anything that's prohibiting this or anything that we can do to, uh, to help get these smaller, tighter subdivisions uh, developed. Mr. Gates? Uh, you said an F and F permit? Like Footing foundation. So, uh, so they tore up. So they could come in and they could, because they're all the same size, you know, if it's, uh, you know, if it's 900, it'd be 30 by 30 or 27 by 27, 25, whatever the, whatever the rectangle, they could, they could come in and place several foundations, build them off and then come back in and then erect the houses on them. I didn't know it rapidly. Uh, you know, I think there is a process for pre approved plans for how the design's been approved. Then you can do a quicker permitting for if you have the same sort of basic plan design uh, submitted again. And is that true in Title 23? Yeah, we need to hear yeah, from yeah, yeah. Through the chair, we already have a pre approved plan process where you get a plan reviewed, approved. Then next time that plan comes in, it does not go through structural architectural plan review, and uh, so it has a reduced permit fee. So that's limited to the individual who, but those plans aren't open to the general public or are like open source, like an open source plan. Yeah. That's what I would like to see: an open source pre-approved plan review, where an individual can go in there, and if they're willing to share them. Maybe if an architect is willing to release their rights, they get a diminished permit fee or whatever it is, because then what happens is that someone can go through and go, here's your set of pre-approved plans. Download PDF. Oh, that's great. Chris? Just to just to supplement that, um, there's jurisdictions that do this pretty successfully that are similar in size and, and scope of Anchorage, so Spokane, for example. Um, and the way they did it was kind of cool. They actually went through a design competition. Uh, so the local architects and builders had a chance to propose some pre, pre-made pre plans. And I think Spokane has four or five floor plans on file as pre-approved set, plan sets that builders and, and buyers can come in and pick. Cool, it's so genius. There's other jurisdictions you can look at. So through the chair, I mean, th these are all great ideas, but so what, why isn't this happening right now? Why isn't what happening? What, what you're describing, why aren't they, why are builders out there building 700 square foot houses by the dozens right now? Well, one is, so what is our minimum lot size? I know 80 feet deep, but what, about 7,000 square feet? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're not talking that, we're talking half that. We're talking 2,000 square foot. So, and particularly when you get out, so there's a couple of reasons. I can tell you out in uh, Chuyak Eagle River, one is uh, there's very few larger lots that so have water and sewer. So it's the cost of bringing in utilities. But you know, the difference is that if you have a two acre parcel, and I did the math, a two acre parcel right now that they could bring in. I was talking to Quinn Builders, a Skylar Quinn and his dad on a lot that they're looking at building on. And they did the aggregate. You know, they, a lot of builders just get into this, hey, this is what we've always done. We've always built these larger homes. We got this three acre parcel. We could come in, we could build probably three really nice houses. We could bring in utilities or maybe an apartment building or whatever that looks like. And we could add 20 units. But when I did the math, I said, if we could get it down to 3,000 square foot lot, 
right? And you could build a 720 square foot house and think of it like New Nacka Valley, you're adding 46 units. They're like, oh, we never even, but here's the problem with that, Kevin. You know, whenever we go in and build these subdivisions, uh, then it just opens up the whole other Pandora's box. You got more houses, so you got more driveways. What does that spacing look like? We have driveway minimum spacing on that. And even though they're two bedroom, one bath cars, they don't need, you know, they could probably get away with one oversized parking spot as opposed to two or three or whatever that looks like. We run into all these other metrics and all these gears that say, you know what, if we're a builder and our profit margins are only 10%, it makes it much easier. I mean, we're, you know, once all these other gears and mechanisms and requirements kick in on these smaller houses, it's much more profitable to build the larger homes. Well, <coughs> plus, you know, we, we're, we're running out of buildable land. Yeah. And so the the lots, there are people buying, they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes to buy a lot. So you're not going to put a 720 square foot house on a lot that you just paid $150,000 for. Yeah, so in District <laughs> 2, we just run into a lot of issues, which is just uh, utilities and not having water and sewer, in which case you got to do a well and septic. And so do you do a community well and a community septic? And what does that look like? And you know, any well that services more than 20 people has federal, I think it's 24 people, requires federal oversight. There's a whole another issue of inspection. It gets really, really expensive. So we have some challenges in our area, at least in Eagle River, just we need to get utilities stretched out. The problem is that, you know, our, our land use code is focused on bigger lots. I mean, CEB, like you look at it, they wanted, when they, when they wrote that decades ago, they wanted larger lots. Now that's come back to kind of bite us because you run a, you run a mile of water and sewer, but it only services 20 houses. Whereas you run a mile of water and sewer here, I can service 2000 houses, right? So uh, it's that, with the economics of scale, scale of economics, but uh, um, so we'll have some challenges that we'll have to get with, and that's working with the Clutin Corp and working with AWW to get that. But, you know, um, I am looking at other lots, and I don't know if this also applies, but, you know, we have large sections of land that has been replatted and designed that is also Class C wetlands, and I don't know what you know, that whole area that's, you know, 100th and, and Minnesota. Yeah. C Street, yeah. Yeah, C, oh, C Street. Well, so you got C Street. There's, you know, that's all been replatted, and there's all those people that owned property that they would never build on. But I'm curious if mobile homes or some of these tiny homes, um, because they don't have such a large ground impact and stuff, if they don't allow us to utilize some of this harder to build on dirt. That's a structural engineer question. But I think we got to start thinking outside the box here. Obviously. You know, and looking at all these different things, because we, you know, you think that we have a housing problem, but we have, I think it's more of a land use problem. Yeah, another, another comment, AD, AEDC is also looking at um, starting with a 501c3 corporation to acquire distressed properties, i.e. downtown parking lots. Yeah. And and convert those into you know, the 401 fire one or other use where they would retain the land and offer a lease and maybe have some advantages because now you're not buying the land, you're leasing the land, nonprofit status, so forth, so on. Yeah, well, re redevelopment. Yep. And, and I guess my other question, and this is research I have to do, is what about on some of these lots where we can't get perks and you can't get good septic? Why not holding tanks? And do they allow holding tanks on the property? Because some of our ADU requirements, you know, if someone wants to add a 300 square foot ADU behind their property, the ADU will cost them 60 grand, but they got to tie, they're required to tie it into the sewer system, which is in front of the property. So it's 100 grand to tie a $60,000 structure into the septic. So then if it's only 300 square feet and it only houses one person, but provides one little great efficiency unit, is there a provision or something you can do in code that would allow for a... Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a holding tank on the property that gets pumped once every two weeks. So through the chair, um, holding tanks aren't allowed for new developments. Holding tanks are allowed for existing developments where they just can't get a, an on-site water and wastewater system to work. Um, through evolution of on-site wastewater treatment systems through the years, we can pretty much get a septic system to work on just about anything now as long as there's enough space. Yeah. Um, but 
one of the problems we found with holding tanks is getting them pumped every few weeks is expensive. And so we do have a problem with people daylighting raw sewage rather than getting it pumped. And th that's likely what why- What do you mean the, daylighting? Does that mean going down the gray, gray water or something? It, or that, or? that means taking the raw sewage in the holding tank and pumping it out onto your yard rather, oh. rather than having the pumper come pump it. Oh. So yeah. that, that's why there's a prohibition on holding tanks basically. Yeah, you wouldn't be real popular in your neighborhood. <laughs> what, about, that, uh, what, what about composting toilets? Man, I had one on my cabinet and that thing worked great. How about non-traditional toilet applications, right? So, I mean, just looking at trying to get it affordable. I know that uh, some people are like, what, composting toilets? But I tell you what, those little propane burning toilets were fiercely awesome <laughs> when you're off the grid. Chris. Uh, sorry, I don't want to take too much of Tom's time, but just a final question. Um, we All of these different ideas we've been talking about over the past several months about housing, I know there's work happening for working, going towards a housing uh, summit of some yeah. kind. Is that scheduled yet? No. I had an email on it that said that somebody wanted to get with me about what was going to be on the agenda. Okay. But all right, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, 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 I believe it's scheduled for after the new members are sworn in. Yeah, we're scheduled. trying for some time in May. May. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, that was a great discussion about non-traditional housing, um, and that will probably be continued in the future. Let's go to new item uh, B, Community Council Boundaries, and I uh, believe Thomas got a presentation for us about that. We have a... Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Todd Davis, Planning Department. Just a brief update. We visited the committee here, I think, in... January or February, and every couple of months, we just want to keep you appraised and provide opportunity to answer any questions you may be hearing. For the end. Excuse me? For the end, sorry. For when he's done. Oh, for when he's done, okay, thanks. thanks, go ahead. And so I'll be very brief. Uh, the information in the handout just basically gives you the, the project in a nutshell of where we are, and I think that's a, a, a good reference for the moment. We'll finalize it and put it online tomorrow. That way uh, your constituents will have the opportunity to be aware of where the project is. Uh, the project has three steps in the public process, and we've completed the first step, which was to collect comments and information about possible boundary issues between community councils. All housing is in a community council. But uh, we uh, were looking at those, and uh, I think the most important thing about these, what we call them boundary study areas, is that they're, at this point, just proposals from members of the public. And we'll run all of them through what we call uh, boundary review criteria, the based in code, which is our community council district areas uh, still reflecting natural neighborhood communities, natural geographic areas, do they uh, still reflect where the community wants to be with respect to community councils? So I, I, I believe that many of these uh, proposals, uh, they won't result in actual recommended changes. So at this point, it's, uh, we have a boundary advisory committee that we've um, had the good fortune to stand up from among the community councils, We're reaching out to the community councils, and I think that we'll be through uh, the second step here in the next month or two to um, have run each of these proposals through the uh, boundary review criteria and be able to have some uh, recommendations out. And the assembly's role at the end uh, will take those uh, recommendations to the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Planning and Zoning Commission will forward its recommendations to the assembly. I do believe that there will be uh, a proposed ordinance that uh, the that assembly will see, just because we do see that at least several or some of these will result in some recommended changes to boundaries, which would end up in a, an amendment to Title II. Just, I, I know I have a couple that were talked about, Old Seward and they should apply to the mutual agreement on moving boundaries, I don't they ever did, but are there any that, that you think are gonna be contested or controversial or, or is the most of it pretty well everyone's in alignment on what should be changed. Um, Just one of the hot spots. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. I can well, one. Yeah. 
We do one. see a couple mm-hmm. of hot spots, and I'm not sure if there's, you know, it's more smoke than fire, but uh, there are a couple of uh, community council um, boundaries that we're looking at where, for example, uh, Portage Valley isn't operating as a community council, so we're trying to figure out what to recommend for the future of that area. Uh, we see some discussion uh, in Girdwood where the group board of supervisors, either their structure or their boundaries, uh, may not be providing the uh, same level of representation to certain members of it. So we see conversation there. Uh, in Midtown, we see a community council that's been struggling to operate. That's Tudor Area Community Council, trying to figure out the future of that community. Uh, we have uh, Spinar Community Council making proposals about Midtown Community Council. We're seeing so contention there. Um, I'm not sure if that, that's a boundary issue or not, but you probably hear something about that. Uh, in Northeast, there's a, a fair amount of comment about the size of Northeast Community Council. So we are looking at that uh, for some reason. That, that's when the garden is the most common. Our community council is so large, it's, uh, we, we think it's having trouble representing our area or whatnot. Um, and um, in downtown, we see there, there's a proposal uh, to uh, shift some of uh, Eastern South Addition to transfer that to Fairview, generally east of A or C Street. There's a piece there. Uh, so I think we're going to see conversation there. Again, all of these will go through the, those boundary review criteria. We'll be talking with the community councils. Great boundary review committee that's operating. Uh, so I think that the, by the time uh, all of this mass, the study areas get to the assembly, uh, we're hoping that most will be resolved and we'll be able to provide you with a very succinct uh, set of uh, recommendations. Okay. Well, great. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Davis. <laughs> Mr. Rivera. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, it's never a dull moment representing Midtown. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, Mr. Davis was a little bit generous when he was speaking about Spinard and Midtown. There's a little bit of a war brewing between those two community councils where Spinard wants to eat up a portion or all of Midtown Community Council in their boundary. So um, when there is obvious friction between two community councils, are the criteria strong enough to help settle that friction? Uh, I believe so. Uh, you know, we, what we've done is we've clarified the, the criteria in code, and we really look at uh, what's called natural communities and a set of factors related to those. We look at strong boundaries, and we look at community desires as to boundaries. And uh, 20 years ago, we recommended the creation of Midtown, because Midtown had developed. It was no longer you know, an empty wetland area at the western margin of Spinar, where it used to be in. So I believe that the boundary review criteria uh, will provide a, a, you know, a, a strong set of, of, of backing for a, a good recommendation there. Uh, which we're fortunate to have. Uh, I'm not sure if that will resolve the concern. There is one criteria about representation, and I think one of the concerns coming from Spinard has to do with are the three to 4,000 residents in Spinard, uh, is, is the way the community council being operated uh, in Midtown affecting that ability? Uh, and you know what, that may not be a boundary issue. We're trying to figure that out. Uh, but we're, we're, we're finding those criteria helpful. I'm not sure if it'll resolve this. So I guess just a couple more things, if I may. Mr. Rivera. Thanks. So if it's not a boundary issue, then is it is, a, is it a policy issue for the assembly? Is that what you're saying? Uh, you know, we're, we're not sure if, if, you know, there's a there's a view that, you know, is there something in the community council's uh, code that should, or some policy that should call for some kind of uh, extra guardrails for how community councils are operated. Uh, another view is uh, community councils are independent and they decide, for example, when their meeting times are and, and sure. whatnot. So right. we are exploring that. Uh, fortunately, we have um, very experienced folks uh, on our committee, including the Ombudsman, who's an ex officio member. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're, they're going to help us sort that out. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Great. Well, it would be wonderful if that got sorted out 
in that committee and that war didn't spill over to the assembly, but we'll see. Um, okay, my second question is about the assembly's role. So um, if we do get an ordinance, which it sounds like we will, is our role is simply yes, no on the ordinance or is there ability for the assembly to make changes? Right. And the assembly has the assembly is the decision making body, so I, I would uh, view that as the assembly has the ability to uh, seek another option. Uh, we are providing options. We have the option A, B, C, whatnot, and so to, to try and identify the credible options, we will recommend one or preferred <coughs> option. Uh, so there'll be other options out there, or if, you know, if the assembly finds you know. Uh, another idea, it, it would have the ability to do that. I think that uh, to the extent possible, if, if those could be identified earlier in the process, you would yeah. get the benefit of some community discussion about those okay. ideas. Yeah, so I'm thinking of similar to like reapportionment where, where we tried as hard as possible to avoid doing any changes on the floor when we did the reapportionment. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that sounds good to me. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Mr. Rivera. Thanks, Mr. Davis. Any, any other additional comments or questions about community council boundaries and reviewing those? I'm not seeing any. <clears throat> we'll go down to item C, third party review. Uh, Mr. Cross. Yeah, I just want to give you guys an update, let you know where we're at. Dean's uh, recently worked on an S version, so 2022-100, 20, uh, again, um, allowing for independent uh, structural plan review of commercial construction, much like what we do for residential, duplex and single family, um, allowing this to go for triplex and larger. Um, originally, it was written much like the residential portion for, du uh, for single family and duplex is written for um, independent uh, structural plan review. But given that commercial construction, you know, uh, covers a much large gambit of, uh, of real estate, uh, some pretty significant amendments have been made. I do want to make sure that you're aware of the five provisions that are in the latest S version. Uh, one, it does mandate that the MOA would uh, audit 10% of all plans submitted through the independent review process for purposes of ensuring code compliance and public safety. So they would have a goal of 10% of those plans being reviewed. So even though they go through the independent process, the building department would still have a chance to, to review those um, and ensure them for quality. And in the cases, uh, number two, in cases of gross negligence, if the billing official determines that the independent plan reviewer um, is either negligent or um, let's just say they're, they're lacks a quality standard, um, that they would be able to put that uh, indiv uh, independent reviewer or, uh, on probation for up to two years. And, and that individual reviewer could appeal that through the building board examiners and appeals, but essentially make sure that those individuals who are we're not producing a quality product, uh, they can be policed much closer. Um, it allows for some sort of control mechanism so that they just don't keep submitting independent review after independent review, particularly in light of uh, if they have not been uh, you know, producing a good, uh, good product. Number three, uh, independent reviewers shall provide insurance coverage. Now, originally we had it up to $1 million, but they said, hey, you know, that could be on a much larger project that may be insignificant. So we amended it to say the insurance requirement would be $1 million or 50% of the estimated value of the development, whichever is greater. So you have a million dollars minimum, but if it's a, and that'd be okay if it's a $2 million development, but if it's a $3 million value development, then they'd need a $1.5 million uh, uh, insurance writer. And then finally, uh, and then we get two others. The building official at the direction of the owner or owner's representative can, shall be authorized to permit and audit plans. So if the owner uses independent plan reviewer but they suspect, they could ask the building department to say, hey, I would like you to audit these plans and take a look at them. So the building or building's representative can make a suggestion. And then finally, um, and probably to me, which was the best, the best thought, and I didn't think about this, that came out of the uh, Structural Engineers Association, is that significant structures as defined under 36.990 are exempt from independent plan review. So what are, what are significant structures? There are housing units of more than 500 people. It's a school. It's a power plant. It's something of, uh, of, of great public concern and interest. So, again, 
really large commercial projects or things, again, that can uh, capacity over 500 individuals or infrastructure, they're exempt. So those, those would not fall under the independent plan review process. Um, I'm hoping that these five very large uh, amendments to 2022-100 uh, um, is what it takes to get it through. Again, it is not our intention to try to bypass the building department. It is just that, you know, the triplex, fourplex, and these smaller apartment buildings is stuff that we can try to get. It is our intention to dramatically increase your workload at the building department. We want more units. We want more stuff. But we also understand that there is a pipeline and there, at peak construction periods, there is a bottleneck. And so how do we responsibly make sure that these things continue to move smoothly, are done safely, but, you know, make sure that it's a streamlined process and utilize all the tools that we have available so that we can keep the cost of construction down. Because the cost of construction and particularly with interest rates and commercial and uh, construction interest rates, they are very high right now. And there's no sign of them backing off. Um, our builder line of credit we've got on a develop right now is like nine and a half percent when it was four percent like a year ago. So it's go more than doubled. And so and that's a cost. You know, the now our payment goes from thirteen thousand to twenty thousand a month just for the carried interest while we fill in this development. That's huge. So every week and every month that stuff doesn't get done, not just me personally, but I can hear from all our from from Criterion to Davis to everybody like Holy crap, it's expensive. How do we get this done faster? So this is just a tool in order to expedite that. Because what ends up happening is these costs just get passed on to consumer, and then we sit here in more meetings and complain about the cost of things. So um, if you have any questions, I'll be sending that out. Uh, I'll send it to you, Ross, but I'll be sending it to the building board. I'll send it to SEAC. I know it's before the 11th. If I don't get feedback, we'll probably extend to the 24th. But I would, my intention is to try to get this done sooner than later so we can take advantage of it because we're entering that peak construction period. And hopefully we can utilize, if it is useful, we can utilize it. But if you guys have any thoughts, I'm completely open. Through, through the Feedback? Chair, through the chair, there is no backlog in plan review right now. Things are getting reviewed within a couple of weeks of when they come in. And, and this, historically, we're in April. This is like the busiest time of year for plan review historically. Okay. Um, so, so are you saying it's bad news for the construction season this year? Um, yeah, it is. It's definitely, um, it, it, um, I don't know how you put it, but it, we've been on a downward trend in construction now for five, six, seven years, and this is the the lowest so far. We're at eighty percent of last year. Last year was the lowest, you know. So, I think, like you're saying, the cost of money is a huge deal aside from all the other macro effects that Anchorage is facing. Well, and that's why the Fed raises interest rates to slow the economy down and they know it works. Yeah. And so it's, it seems to be working here, <coughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it won't stay flow, uh, slow for long. My hope is that this is a benefit to our community. And this didn't just, you know, was it pulled out of a hat out of thin air, Ross, as you know. Uh, this came uh, because of uh, much input from our construction industry and the private sector that something like this was a needed tool. So um, we're responding to the, the, the private sector's requests, and I'm hoping that uh, this is something that benefits all of us. So thank you. All right. Well, we're down to the last few minutes here. I'm wondering if there's anyone uh, that would like to... Uh, be involved in our audience participation. Well, actually, Robin te just texted me said she wants that she had something to add. Okay. okay, Robin, you got the floor. That was a while ago, so I don't have anything to add now. But thank you for all of your work. And um, Kevin, I'll, I'll just get in touch with you directly. I have some comments on what you just presented, and I can give those to you one on one. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. Thanks, Mr. Ern. <clears throat> Manny, do we have anybody on the line who might be interested in audience participation Any that you can see? No one? Anyone? One last thing. Uh, Amanda Moser is putting together the Housing Summit for May, and I don't know if she's contacted you all, but it would be valuable to have someone from planning. Yeah. So if you're not connected, let us know if we'll connect you. Yeah, if someone could send me a meeting invite in, or... <laughs> we'll, we'll, we need to keep Ross in the loop on that. 
Uh, I'll, I'll send Amanda and Ross a note just so she knows that we want you there or someone in our district. All okay. right, fantastic. Well, not seeing anyone interested in audience participation, I'll take a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. We are adjourned.